good evening. Good to see everybody. Good to see folks coming out on this Wednesday night. Thank y'all for being here in the house of the Lord. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. I, I had an announcement that I was uh, asked to make. Miss Pam asked me to make an announcement on behalf of the family of Miss Bonnie Faye Taylor. She passed away. There's going to be a funeral service Saturday, graveside only, uh, at Lisman Cemetery at 1.30. Uh, the church will be providing food after the uh, graveside service, so please get in touch with Pam if you can help with that. If you don't get in touch with her, don't be surprised if she calls you, so you all need to certainly help with that family. Uh, I'm sure we have other announcements or prayer requests. Any prayer requests anybody wants to mention tonight? Yes, ma'am. So a, a good friend's daughter is at death's door with COVID in Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. Any other prayer requests we want to mention tonight? Your mother-in-law, ex-mother-in-law, ex -mother Connie James. Pancreatic cancer and not doing well, so we need to remember Miss Connie James, okay, and her family. Any other prayer requests anybody wants to mention tonight? Pray for your family, okay? All right. Anything else anybody wants to mention tonight? Any prayer request? Sister Phyllis, will you pray for us? Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight just so thankful for the opportunity to be back in your house again with our family, with our, those of like precious faith. God, as we come before you tonight, we just have to thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace the love that you've bestowed upon us, your many, many blessings to us. And God, you have heard as these prayer requests have gone out tonight. There are so many, Lord, that are struggling with sickness in their body. They're struggling with cancer in their body. They're fighting the throes of COVID. So many situations, God. There are those that are struggling with uh, emotional issues and, and mental issues and there are lost loved ones, God, that desperately need you. Lord, there are those that have lost family members this week, God, that are in the throes of grief. And Lord, I'm so thankful tonight that there's not a single one of these prayer requests that are so large that you cannot intervene. And there's not a single one that is so small that it is insignificant in your eyes stand together with our brothers and sisters and we lift one another up and we bring these needs to you and ask that you would show up in ways that only you can father that you would move in mighty ways and you would show yourself strong and mighty lord and father in those circumstances that seem hopeless god would you speak hope would you speak life there god and lord we will be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all of it Lord, around this church tonight, Lord, there are people teaching your word to every age group. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would rule and reign in each classroom, Lord, here in the sanctuary with us. Anoint our teachers tonight, God, to bring your word, touch hearts, and challenge us tonight. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that prayer. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the life of Elijah tonight. Uh, when you get that video ready, you just let me know. We're going to uh, do the video portion, probably instead of the middle of this thing, kind of in the beginning, but I, I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, <clears throat> the, the central theme tonight was Elijah on Mount Carmel. You know, we talk about a mountaintop experience sometime. Elijah certainly had a mountaintop experience on Mount Carmel. And there are other great mountaintop experiences that you can think about in the scripture, but Elijah didn't spend all the time on the mountain. 
and we're going to talk about that a little bit. I wanted to first give you some background of the situation in Israel that led up to the conflict that occurred on Mount Carmel. <clears throat> now, it really goes back to Saul, who was the first king of Israel. And we've talked about Saul. And <clears throat> Saul was the people's choice. Remember, God said, I gave you the king you asked for. And they picked him because he looked like the guy that they wanted. But remember, it didn't work out, and he was dis disobedient, and the kingdom was taken from him. And who was it given to? David. David. And David didn't look like kingly material at all, remember? When uh, Samuel went up to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king, he said, bring all your sons in here. And Jesse didn't even bring David because it just never occurred to Jesse that David would be God's choice. But David was God's choice. Why? Because he looked the part? No, because of his heart. God looks at the heart. And God said, David is a man after my own heart. So David <clears throat> became the king. And actually, uh, our interim pastor, uh, has been, Brother Jerry, has been on a long series about David. It's been wonderful. It's been awesome. I've learned things I didn't know, even scriptures that I read before. He, he's helped me to understand them in a new way. And so we've learned so much about David. <clears throat> and the thing about David is even though he made many mistakes in his life, even though he made major mistakes in his life, each time he would repent and he would continue to serve the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but that feels like me because I stumble too. But I try to repent and I try to continue serving the Lord. The Bible records that God called David a man after my own heart. <clears throat> and so after David, Solomon becomes the next king. Now, does anybody remember, we covered this in class one Sunday, Brother Jerry did, does anybody remember who Solomon's mother was? Bathsheba. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Solomon's mother. Yeah, David's. Who was Solomon's mother? Bath. Yeah, second child, Bathsheba. Their first child died. Right, David and Bathsheba's first child. But the second child was named Solomon. And really, the story of Solomon becoming the king is really an amazing story of redemption. How God forgives David. How he forgives Bathsheba. And how their son is chosen to be the next king. And actually... He falls in the lineage of Christ. If you go to the New Testament and you look at the genealogies, you'll find out Solomon's name is mentioned. Bathsheba's name is mentioned in the lineage of Christ. So Solomon becomes the next king. At Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam was chosen to be the next king. But in many, many ways, Solomon made decisions that led to the division of the kingdom. God had warned the men of Israel not to marry pagan wives from the other nations. Why? Because they'd bring their idols with them and they would corrupt the future generations. God had warned them not to do that. But Solomon married lots of women, pagan women. Also, God had warned that their leaders were not to multiply wives. Multiply wives. Solomon had hundreds of wives and I think maybe 800 concubines. It wound up being more than a thousand women that Solomon married. And Solomon allowed them to worship the idols from all the places that they came from. And so those thousand women, a lot of them brought their idols with them. 
And so by the time Solomon dies, idol worship has gained a foothold in the land. It's really gained a strong hold in the land. And so Solomon dies, and he appoints his son Rehoboam to be his heir. But Rehoboam foolishly disregards the advice of Solomon's advisors and refuses to listen to the concerns of the Israelites in the northern part of the kingdom. And as a result of this, as really a result of his arrogance, there are tragic consequences. The kingdom which had been unified under Saul and under David and under Solomon is divided, it's ripped apart. The ten northern tribes pulled out. And from then on, they're referred to in the scripture as Israel and the kings of Israel. And the two southern tribes, the great big tribe of Judah and the little bitty tribe of Benjamin, they remain in the south. And from then on in the, in the scripture, they're the kingdom of Judah. And they're referred to as the kings of Judah. And so we, we see this situation where now the nation is divided into a southern kingdom called Judah and a northern kingdom called Israel. And it began when Rehoboam was unwise. Now in the north, they wanted a king too, and they appointed a fellow by the name of Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Now Jeroboam turns out to be a wicked man, and he's the first in a long line of wicked men and wicked kings who were kings over that northern kingdom, that kingdom of Israel. Now, Jeroboam and his advisors realized they were going to have a problem keeping their subjects from wanting to travel to and worship in Jerusalem, which was in the southern kingdom. So they came up with a plan to keep folks at home. They were afraid if they wanted to go down there and worship, they might one day want to reunite. And they said, well, we can't have that. We can't have them going down there and worship. We've got to offer them some alternatives. We've got to give them something else to do. Now, remember, by this time, Jerusalem was the center of worship for the nation. Solomon had built the temple there, and it was dictated by the law that on the major feast days that all the people were to travel to Jerusalem to participate in these major feasts like Passover. There were others. And they were to gather in Jerusalem, worship God, and make sacrifices at the temple. And it wasn't just the presence of the temple in Jerusalem that mandated that they go there to worship, but all the priests were in Jerusalem. All the priests, they were descended from Aaron, and they were all right there in Jerusalem. And not just the priests, but the Levites who worked at the temple, who were experts in the law, they were all in Jerusalem. And so Jeroboam and his advisors come up with a plan to keep people from going to Jerusalem to worship. And the first thing they do, it just really floors me. You know what they do? They say, well, we're going to find two cities in the northern kingdom, and we're going to set up places to worship. And they built two golden calves to worship in the northern kingdom. Can you imagine? Remember what happened when Moses was up on the mountain on Mount Sinai and God gave the law and he came down? What, what did he find that they had built? A golden calf. Where'd they pick that up? That was one of the gods in Egypt. And so the very first thing that Jeroboam tries to do is to try to reestablish idol worship in the northern kingdom. But there were still people that wanted to go to the temple to worship God. So that the next thing they did is they built a second temple. Now the temple was on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, but they built another one in Samaria. So, well, if you want to worship the God of Israel, just stay right here in Samaria. But they didn't have any priest. No problem. They just appointed some folks to be priest. 
They didn't have any Levites, no problem. They just appointed some counterfeit priests and counterfeit Levites, and they tried to have temple worship there in Samaria. You know, it went on for a long, long time. Remember the woman at the well? Remember Jesus goes through Samaria. He encounters the woman at the well, and she starts to argue with him about, well, you, your people say you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem, but, you know, we say you're supposed to worship here on this mountain. That's where all that started. That's what that was all about. And so if all this wasn't bad enough, that they had two golden calves and a counterfeit temple and counterfeit priest and counterfeit Levi's, they also began more and more to worship the idols of the nations around them. The idols of the Canaanite people. Now, why had God told them to drive out the Canaanite people to begin with? Why did Joshua and the nation drive them out? Because of the detestable practices that they were involved in worshiping those Canaanite idols. And one of the chief Canaanite idols, and y'all have all heard his name, his name was Baal. Now, Baal means Lord in the Canaanite language. And they would begin to obscure the idea that Baal, who was Lord in Canaanite, and Adonai, the God of Israel, means Lord in Hebrew. And they tried to convince the people, well, you know, when you're worshiping Baal, it's just the same thing. Just as good. It's just as good. But you see, Baal was very different from the God of Israel. For one thing, he was married. Baal was married to Asherah, the Canaanite goddess. This was his wife, right? And they, were, they weren't the only gods. They had a whole host of other gods that were to be worshipped. And so all this was going on. And they told a very, very dangerous lie. And it's a lie that you'll still hear today. And the lie went something like this. You know, isn't all religion really the same I mean, if you're sincerely worshiping, does it really matter who you worship? Well, it really matters if you're not worshiping the God of heaven. And he's a jealous God. And he's not going to permit all of this. So if you go down the list of the Israelite kings, those northern kingdom kings that followed Jerobo Jeroboam, they fall deeper and deeper into idolatry and sin with every generation. And you find that worship of the true God of Israel was being pushed aside. And finally, there's a wicked king named Omri. And the scripture said that he was worse than everybody that came before him by a lot but he wasn't the worst one to come and so Omri makes an alliance with one of the Canaanite kings and he gets his son Ahab to marry a daughter of the Canaanite king and her name is Jezebel Jezebel and so now Ahab is married to the pagan queen Jezebel, and they are rule, ruling in the northern kingdom. <clears throat> now, Ahab and Jezebel go on a mission to get rid of the worship of, God, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. They don't just want to coexist peacefully anymore. They want to blot it out. They want to put an end to it. And so they systematically begin hunting down the prophets of the true God and putting them to death. And, and they ultimately even try to claim that Baal and, and Jehovah God, they're one and the same. A couple of years ago, I, I, I read some archaeology stuff, and I was really excited that they found some ancient stones from that period of time with the following thing engraved on them. And it said, 
for Adonai, that's the Lord God of Israel, and his wife Asherah. That's where it had gotten that Baal and God were really the same. We're not going to worship the God of Israel anymore. We'll just worship Baal, and we're going to get rid of anybody that has anything different to say about it. And so in this mess of idolatry, persecution, deception, and murder, a real man of God shows up. A real man of God shows up. Can you play the video now? We're having technical difficulties, so I'm going to tell you what happens. Elijah appears on the scene. And he appears in 1 Kings 17.1. And the scripture says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. First appearance of Elijah in the Old Testament. Now Elijah's name means my God is Jehovah. And he shows up and he tells Ahab, I'm going to pray that it's not going to rain and it's not going to. And it's not going to rain again until I pray that it rains again. Interesting things about Elijah before we get to Mount Carmel. He's from Tishbe in Gilead. Anybody really heard very much about Tishbe in Gilead? That's because there's not much to hear about Tishbe in Gilead. It was a little bitty village way out in the country. A little bitty place way out in the country. So think about this. God uses one man from one small town, one man in one small town to change the direction of a whole nation. So don't just, don't ever get to thinking, hey, there's just one of me and where am I and what can I do? God used one man. Now, if we actually want to know how Elijah got prepared for this moment when he faced down Ahab the king, the background story is really probably not where you would look for it. You would think you'd find it in the Old Testament, wouldn't you? But actually, you don't. If you want to find how Elijah got ready for this, you go to the New Testament to the book of James, and he's going to give us a little bit of detail about this story. In James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, James writes, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So we get a little bit of background, actually, in the book of James about Elijah before he appears on the scene and confronts King Ahab and ultimately has that great confrontation 
on Mount Carmel. So I've told you all that to get to what I want to tell you. That's the introduction, right? How much time we got left? What I want to talk to you about tonight is life lessons from Elijah. Life lessons from Elijah. Lesson number one. Elijah chose to pray and obey the Lord. Elijah chose to pray and obey the Lord. In fact, he's the example of a righteous man praying fervently and availing much, right? In the New Testament, that's who James, the half-brother of Jesus, goes to to give us an example. So he ch before he ever appeared on the scene, before he was ever a national figure, before he ever confronted the king, he was in a little small town with a mom and daddy who cared about him and gave him that name. The Lord is my God. And they taught him how to pray. And they taught him how to obey. And that's how he lived his life. So Elijah chose to pray and obey the Lord. That's the first thing from his life. The second life lesson from Elijah that I want to talk to you about is Elijah continues to follow the Lord through every season of his life. All the way through from the beginning to the end Elijah follows the Lord in every season of his life. And whether it was on the mountain calling down fire or not knowing where his next meal was going to go come from because he didn't have a next meal till he was sent to the home of the widow and God provided for him. He followed the Lord in every season of life. Even in the dried up brook in the valley, he followed the Lord. Number three, Elijah was faithful even when it was hard. I don't know about y'all, it's pretty easy for me to be faithful when everything's going pretty good, you know. But it's in the struggle. And if you live in this world, Jesus said you're going to struggle. And Elijah was faithful, even when it was hard. At one time, he was down to not even having his next meal. And God sends him where? To the widow's house, where she only had enough for one more meal, and then she was going to die. You know, it's a long way from the great victory on Mount Carmel to the widow's house. But Elijah was faithful even when it was hard. And it just reminds me of a lesson that, that a pastor taught me one time. You know, God is in the business of calling each one of us to grow in holiness. And he's really more concerned with our long-term holiness than our short-term happiness. Now, he wants us to be happy. He insist on providing us with joy but he's more concerned with our long term holiness than our short term happiness and Elijah was faithful even when it was hard <clears throat> the next lesson that I want to mention from the life of Elijah is God gave him victory when it really counted God gave him the victory when it really mattered at just the right time, fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. At just the right time, the ravens feed Elijah. At just the right time, God sends him to the widow's house. So if you're wondering today, God, where's my victory? Where is it? I've been praying for it. Where is it? When's it coming? You know, my, my good friend, Pastor Fulcher, used to say two little words, trust God. Because you can count on this. If you're already praying, he's already working. Hear that? If you're already praying, he's already working. And he's working on your victory. And just like in Elijah's life, it's going to be just on time, right on time. 
every time. Another lesson that I see in the life of Elijah is God was tender with Elijah when he was weak. Right after the great victory on Mount Carmel when he has the big showdown with the prophets of of Baal, Elijah was exhausted. He gets word that Jezebel is sending the army to kill him. He flees. Now Elijah got to a point right after this great victory where he was anxious, he was depressed, he even wanted to die. He said, Lord, just take my life now. And what happened? He's all out there by himself, and there's nobody to pray for him, and there's nobody to touch him. The scripture says God sent an angel to touch him. And that wasn't the only time. Shortly after that, he needed that touch again, and God sent the angel again to touch him. The angel came back to touch him. And so let me just tell you this today. You may find yourself where Elijah was when he needed that touch. Maybe you're struggling like Elijah was with being anxious, afraid, or depressed. Maybe you're not even sure you want to live. Sometimes you struggle so you feel like you're going to drown. Well, let me give you a word from the word. God wants to touch you. He wants to touch you today. The next lesson from the life of Elijah that I find in the scripture is Elijah invested in the next generation. Elijah thought for a while there he was the only prophet left, but he found out, nope, God had plans, God was working, God had preserved and protected other people, other young people in the ministry to serve as prophets. And so Elijah goes from thinking he's the only prophet left to becoming the leader of what? The school for the prophets. And Elijah does his job. He invests in the life of the, uh, those young people, and he's their leader, and he teaches them and trains them. And not just them, but he also trains Elisha to be the next national prophet and the next leader of the school. So one lesson for sure that we can learn from the life of Elijah is let's make sure we're investing in the next generation, in our children, in our young people, in young couples in our community. Let's make sure we're investing them. Now, I I believe whoever God calls to be the next pastor of this church, I I just feel like he's going to lead us to invest heavily in the next generation. Number seven, that was six points, by the way. God was with him in the end. God was with Elijah in the end. You know, there's a great benefit that comes from faithfully serving God throughout your whole life. And and, and as I look at what the scripture teaches about how we faithfully serve God our whole life, really it boils down to three things. We have to have first the right start. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 in the nighttime, he said you must be born again. So you've got to have the right start. You've got to be born again. Secondly, you have to continue in the faith. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're going to be alive spiritually, you have to grow. And if you're going to grow, you've got to be attached to the vine. And finally, if we're going to faithfully serve him, we have to finish strong. Jesus even said, he who endures to the end will be saved. And so Elijah did all those things. And he was with God. In the end, remember what happened? He's caught up to heaven in a whirlwind. 
Now, I, I got to looking at that passage of Scripture there where it says Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind. Now, where else in Scripture do you find anything like that? That's a picture of the rapture. You know, the word rapture is actually not at, in the Bible, at least not in the English translations of the Bible. The word rapture comes from a Latin word that was in an old Latin translation of the Bible that was used for years and years and years. But that word rapture in Latin came from two words in the Greek. You know what they mean? Caught up. Caught up. And so he was caught up because he faithfully served the Lord. But you know what? There's a great catching up coming For all of us who follow Jesus faithfully. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 5 through 7. 15, 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 through 17. According to the Lord's word. We tell you that we who are still alive. We are left until the coming of the Lord. And certainly will not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Catch this. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Comfort one another with these words there's a great catching up coming I want to be there I want to be ready I want to be ready finally and this is my last point this is number eight Elijah got to see Jesus didn't he he got to see Jesus we actually started our story of Elijah, not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, there in the book of James, where we got the back story. And the story of Elijah continues on in the New Testament. At the Transfiguration. Now, the Transfiguration is in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And um, let me read the account in Luke, just a few verses from it briefly. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking to him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. How about that? Elijah saw Jesus. And how did he see Jesus? Well, you see, he saw him as he really was. That's what happened at the transfiguration for just a brief period of time. The veil was lifted. They were able to see Jesus as he really was. Um, if I can find it, there's a Greek word there. Now, in most of your English translations, it says something like Jesus became dazzling or Jesus was brilliant white or something like that. But the Greek word there, if I can say this correctly, is exastropton. Is exastropton. Now, what does that mean and why do I bring it up? Well, the second half of that word is the same word that's translated lightning in the scripture. When, you, when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a lightning, it was strepton, the last part of that word. But the first part of that word, the exus, what that means is Jesus wasn't reflecting light. The light was coming from him. And Moses and Elijah, they were just reflecting light the light of Jesus just reflectors 
of the life that was really coming from Jesus. And, and so I thought about Revelation chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. And John, writing in the book of Revelation, said, I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Jesus is the light. They don't need the sun in heaven because Jesus is there. And he's the source of light. And Moses and Elijah, they get close enough to it to reflect that glory. But not just them. But our own lives are littered with things we're hoping will give us meaning and We might get her back around to it. I'm already rolling. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, John writes this. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Folks, I got something to be excited about today. See, one day this old person in all my imperfections, I'm going to see him. And it's better than that. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be like him. That light. I'm going to get to reflect it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to reflect that light too. And that's coming. And that's glorious. But I want to share this with you. We don't have to wait till that day to start the process. We can start reflecting his light right now. We can start sharing his light right now now maybe tonight like Elijah you're at a point in your life when you need a touch from the Lord in fact I, I think maybe I'll ask is there anybody here that would like to raise their hand if they, they feel like they need a touch from the Lord in their mind in their body yeah I bet there are a lot of folks here that need a touch from the Lord or maybe tonight you've decided that what you really need to be is a better reflector of who he is a better reflector of him. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He said, so let your light shine before men. Let me see if I can find it so I don't misquote it. Here's the whole passage. Matthew 5, verses 15 and 16. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I, I need a touch from the Lord myself, and I want to be a better reflector of his light. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. Because this is a dark world. And you know what? You're the only light of Jesus that most folks are ever going to get to see. That's it. Are you going to reflect that? Or are you going to hide it under the bushel basket?
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, we pray that your spirit would move freely among us. Lord, that you would touch people here that need a touch from you, that there would be healing, that there would be restoration, that there would be peace. God, we pray that whatever it is in our life, that stops us from reflecting your light, that we'd clean that up so we would shine. And we ask all these things in the name of the one who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything we ask or imagine, the strong name of Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.